Good afternoon, both to those of you in the room um, and those watching online. Um, this session is being web streamed. Um, I'm sure you don't need reminding that you can use the conference app to tweet or to ask questions. I shall be looking out for questions um, on the other iPad I've got with me here. Um, welcome to this session on the future of DB. I'm Frank Johnson. Um, I'm just about to complete my two year term as chair of the PLSA's DB Council. Following select committee inquiries, a spring green paper, a white paper on its way, recent announcements by the PLSA and TPR, amongst others, focusing on good governance. What will the future hold for DB schemes and what should their priorities be? To help tackle these important questions, I'm delighted to be joined on stage by Charlotte Clark, Director, Private Pensions and Stewardship at the DWP, Chris Hogg, Chief Executive of the Royal Mail Pension Trustees and incoming Chair of the DB Council. Welcome, Chris. I'm glad you're taking over tomorrow. <laughs> and Leslie, Chief Executive of the Pensions Regulator. They'll all give their views um, on this following, which will open up for a more general panel discussion and a Q&A session. Um, but to set the scene, um, we'll hear first from Leslie. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And I, uh, good morning, or even good afternoon, everybody. And it's great to be here. I feel very privileged to have the 15 minute slot up front. Thank you very much to the PLSA. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the landscape for DB pensions because whilst DC is now numerically the dominant form of provision, um, it's still DB that's making a lot of the headlines at the moment. Um, so we have for you a summary slide uh, painting a picture of the DB world as it is right now. And I, We'll just talk a little bit about that and I'll move on to the regulatory landscape that applies in that situation as well. I think it's important to stress that our data shows that the majority of schemes, DB schemes, are supported by employers that can support their deficits. We believe that the majority will be able to meet their obligations as they fall due and the majority of members will receive the full pension payments that they're entitled to. But it is true that many DB scheme deficits, however you measure it, have increased dramatically in recent years, mostly, of course, because of persistently low interest rates. And it is true that some employers struggle to make their deficit repair contributions, usually for reasons that have nothing to do with their pension schemes. Now, the slide here shows you the estimated cash outflow from DB schemes over the next 60 odd years the percentage of schemes open to new members, the percentage of memberships that are active, the total number of schemes, and the total number of members who are on D in DB or, D or hybrid schemes. I'll give you just a moment to digest that. But what we're trying to do here is just to remind you the size and shape of the DB world. And as I've said, we do recognize that the situation is not easy for many of these schemes. The challenging economic conditions have been well documented and are likely to continue in some form. While most schemes remain affordable for their employers and most are unlikely to end up in the excellent pension protection fund, such a key part of our uh, framework for DB, we believe that many schemes should do more to tackle their deficit and reduce the risk to their members and to the PPF. We acknowledge that there are many demands on employers' cash. When I talk about, we talk about affordable, contributions being affordable, that is, of course, a regulator's perspective on affordable, a narrow definition. Uh, affordable means different things to different employers and other stakeholders. There's an entirely separate debate to be had as to whether it is in the long run desirable or fair, for example, between generations to pay big sums into DB schemes on an ongoing basis. But as the regulator, we think that if employers can pay into their scheme to repair deficits, then we think they should pay into their schemes. And we have particular concerns if we think that a scheme is not being treated fairly in comparison to other stakeholders. For example, if dividend payments are being prioritized over deficit repair contributions. This is an example of us trying to make our expectations clearer. We said this point about dividends in our annual funding statement this year. 
And it leads me on to speak a little bit about what we're trying to do in response to the changing regulatory landscape uh, through how we regulate. Now, I'm sure that many of you will have heard about TPR Future, which is the project that the TPR board and I commissioned towards the end of last year to review our regulatory approach and to make sure that we remain an effective regulator for the next five to ten years. There are three phases to the project. The first was an independent review, diagnosis, analysis, looking at the risks and opportunities that we face over the next 10 years. That stage is now complete. And in summary, what we learned from that stage, from what you, our stakeholders, were telling us, is that we need to be clearer, quicker, and tougher as a regulator. And we have already been uh, started to evolve in that direction making changes internally to the way we work. And some of you may have seen evidence of this in practice. We are acting more quickly, for example, in how we progress cases. We are starting to exercise the full suite of regulatory powers that are available to us. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in a moment. We're now into the second stage of TPR Future, the design stage. And this is where we're looking at the different regulatory approaches that will be needed across our remit. We are, of course, an experienced DB regulator, but more and more the demands on us are around public sector schemes, DC, master trusts, and so on. This stage is likely to last until the spring of next year, and then we'll move into the implementation phase. For example, we are looking to broaden the range of tools and techniques that we employ as a regulator. We will, in certain circumstances, need to actively monitor and test compliance. We want to, uh, for example, move forward the point of interaction with schemes in certain cases to become more proactive. It may result, for a limited number of schemes, for example, in us having a more active, ongoing relationship with those schemes, rather than, for example, in DB world, centering everything around the three-year valuation cycle. Another example, and some which you may experience, uh, some of you relatively soon, is that we have two thematic projects underway. These are pilot projects to see how these might work, one looking at the issue of value for members and another at maintaining pension contributions. We're considering others. Other obvious topics we could look at would be investment policies or how schemes are dealing with cyber risk. These thematic projects may well cover all types of scheme, DB, DC, Master Trusts, everything, and schemes of all sizes. So small schemes shouldn't imagine that they may fly under our radar. We're also looking at the best way to increase our regulatory acti activity across that whole range of schemes, both by sector and size, um, but also to target our communications better. We hear that bigger schemes and smaller schemes have different needs. Uh, from us, and we need to reflect that. I don't want to preempt the output of stage two too much, obviously, it's still in progress. Uh, we'll say more about it early next year. I want to emphasize, though, it's not about us seeking more powers, and I'm going to leave the whole issue of the white paper to Charlotte, as we have her here. Um, what TPR Future is about is about us using our existing range of powers as effectively as possible alongside other regulatory tools. So turning to our use of powers, for many years our regulatory approach at TPR has been to, enable, uh, to educate, enable and enforce, and many would say that the emphasis has been largely on education. But the TPR future feedback and other surveys and so on that we've done, what we're hearing from our regulated community is that they want us and expect us to be tougher on those who do not comply. So we are becoming tougher. We're intervening more quickly, earlier in the process, as I said, and we're using some of our powers for the first time. Now, I know that the power that excites the DB community more than anything is Section 231. For the uninitiated, it's the power to impose a schedule of contributions if we are not satisfied with what has been agreed between the trustee and the employer. I can confirm that we have issued a warning notice in respect of a Section 231 case, it will not surprise you to know that I'm not going to say any more than that about it. Other than that, it demonstrates that we can and will intervene if we see a scheme being treated unfairly 
and we have other potential cases in the pipeline. <coughs> Section 231 cases are complex, and the power must, in the end, be exercised by our determinations panel, a group of people separate from the investigation. So we have to persuade them that it is the right thing to do. They are then open to being challenged further in the upper tribunal, and possibly beyond that. So the warning notice is only the first stage in the process, and at any point, of course, there is the possibility that the targets decide uh, to come and offer us a settlement. And if that is good enough, then it may be appropriate for us to settle the case at that point and not proceed. So it is impossible to judge at this point whether any or all cases will go through and result in a, a final decision. We're also using certain of our powers for the first time in what we call our compliance with the basics work. Uh, the best example of this is fining trustees when they fail to send in a scheme return or, uh, in certain cases, a, a, a chair's statement in DC world. In, around two th in 2016, around 10% of schemes were late or, uh, in sending in their scheme return or didn't send it in at all, and this is unacceptable. Now, we have been accused in using this power of being a bit heavy-handed or having abandoned our risk-based approach to regulation because failing to submit a scheme return is such a small failing and isn't, doesn't pose a risk to members. But I'm afraid I don't believe that this argument holds. We can only operate effectively as a regulator by collecting information from our regulated community, and the annual return is very often our only engagement with certain schemes. It helps us monitor the landscape, identify risks, and then target our main regulatory effort and communications much better. So scheme returns have a hugely important role in helping us to apply our limited resources as effectively as possible. We also believe that failing to get the basics right, such as sending in annual returns, can be symptomatic of more serious failings in a scheme. And we are also well aware of the deterrent effect of fines in this area for a period at least. So this takes me on to our other key area of focus at the moment, what we call our 21st century trustee work, our ongoing programme of work to drive up the standards of governance across all schemes, as relevant to DB schemes as it is to DC and to public sector schemes. Our research shows that there is some very, very good practice out there. But it also shows that compliance with the standards, existing standards, is very patchy. There is some very, very good thinking going on in the industry about governance. The PLSA's recent report, Good Governance, How to Get There, for example, which talks about the importance of having the right people on trustee boards and the ingredients that make up a good governing body, such as collective technical knowledge and a diversity of thinking and perspectives, is greatly to be welcomed. We are very much aligned with that, and our message to trustees who are not up to standard is quite clear, it's time to step up. There is a rump uh, which, where it is quite clear that they are not responsive to messages from the regulator, for example. Our focus, therefore, is on working out how we can possibly get those schemes to engage, and if they persist in falling below the required standards, then we will take necessary action. Now, we want, obviously, to use the levers that are most effective in this situation. So we are, for example, working with professional trustees. We've published a definition of what we mean by a professional trustee, and we are encouraging uh, that sector of the industry to develop its own standards. We'd like to see the evidence of skills and knowledge in this sector, preferably through some sort of accreditation. And as I've said, at the other end of the spectrum, we've been looking at poor standards of trusteeship, such as when trustees fail to submit recovery plans on time, poor record keeping, not responding to requests for information, or where trustee boards don't have the appropriate level of knowledge and understanding. The communications campaign, the additional tools that we will provide via our website should all help with this. And our goal here is to ensure that the governance of all schemes gets to a good minimum standard. As I've said, we want to be very clear about what our expectations are and how we will measure them. We want to provide tools, 
but we will consider enforcement action where we see persistent failing below the standard or particularly egregious examples of poor behaviour. This could include sending improvement notices, issuing fines for breaches of law, or even replacing trustees who do not demonstrate the appropriate knowledge and understanding. As the PLSA said in its report, it's as much about the people as the process. Of course, the other way that can, this be, addre that can be addressed is uh, poor behaviour can be addressed and, and low standards is by encouraging consolidation, encouraging the trustees to consider consolidation. Now, clearly, this is much more challenging for DB schemes than it is for DC, and I know we're going to pick up on that on the panel. So, certainly a challenging few years just gone for DB schemes. We understand that. We've heard the message loudly from the well-behaved among the regulatory community that they both need us to be clearer about what's expected of them, when, what, uh, whether that relates to funding, whether it relates to governance or to anything else, and that they expect us to take action where we see poor practice and people persistently flowing, uh, falling below standards. We have heard those messages. And we are responding and we're absolutely committed to helping those trustees and employers to do the, who want to do so to do the right thing by their members in these challenging times. Thank you. Leslie, thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to invite Charlotte to say a few words. Um, uh, thank you, and thanks to Leslie for uh, her kind of uh, very, very broad canter through the DB uh, environment. Uh, I was watching the auto enrolment session yesterday with Jamie, Chris, and Rustin, uh, managing to talk about the auto enrolment review without actually saying anything that's in the auto enrolment <laughs> review. It is my job for the next five minutes to talk about the DB white paper without actually saying what is in the DB white paper. Um, so a bit like them, I'll, I'll give you some of the history of how we have got to where we are and you know, some of the themes that we're looking at as we uh, start to consider the, the DB white paper. Uh, I don't think it's any great surprise to anybody in this room that, that government hasn't been focusing a lot on defined benefits over the last 10 years. Uh, the last two years, however, I think you know, the focus, given BHS, given Tata Steel, given the kind of volatility of, of the financial markets post-Brexit, certainly last summer, uh, you know, we found ourselves with much more focus on what we were doing uh, in, the, uh, in the defined benefit area. Uh, one, one of the joys of my job is I spend half of my time talking to people like you who know all about pensions, uh, the other part of my job is talking to people who know absolutely nothing about pensions in other parts of government, uh, it, you know, to other commentators, and trying to make them understand uh, where things are and why we do things the way we do things. Um, I think the, the focus that, that we've had on DB over the last two years, I, I actually think has been quite helpful. Of course, none of us would want to, to repeat some of the, the issues and some of the uh, it's particularly for some of the members involved in, in what has happened in some of those schemes. But what has been quite helpful is bringing that focus back onto DB and really allowing us some time and energy to really look at the sector. And that was what we were trying to do with the green paper, which I know many people felt was too green. Uh, but I, listening to the discussion yesterday about really good pensions policy and the thinking about the Pensions Commission, we can all think of our favourite example of bad pensions policy when government has reacted to something. Uh, uh, when we think about good pensions policy, it is when we have taken our time to really think things through, to uh, consult as broadly as possible, and to try and bring as many people into the discussion as we possibly can, which is often very difficult because we're all kind of engaged in this debate. It's trying to engage other people who who will be affected by some of these changes uh, into that discussion and trying to get their voices in as well. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume most people have read the Green Paper. Um, well done. Um, <laughs> uh, but, I mean, in terms of the themes of that Green Paper, I mean, the overarching message, which I think, you know, uh, Leslie's slide uh, showed very well, is... Yes, this is a sector where there are some issues, but this is not a sector in crisis. This is not, there is not major problems throughout the whole of this sector, 
but there, are there things that we can do to try and improve the security, the sustainability of this sector as we move into rundown of this sector? You know, the, the assets in this sector do, uh, do start to kind of fall in the next 10 years or so. And so uh, there's a, the, we are entering a different stage for it. And so really taking the time to think about whether the structures that we have are right. Uh, you know, I think this, this is a good time to do that. Uh, turning to towards the white paper, the themes of the white paper pretty much follow the themes of the green paper in terms of policy areas. Um, some, there will be some discussion around members' benefits, so with regards to indexation, uh, you know, do we do things to, uh, to change the way indexation is, is, uh, is across all schemes? Is there some sort of override that needs to come in? Uh, that area, there will be uh, quite a lot of discussion around consolidation. I mean, I should at this time just thank the PLSA for all of their excellent work on consolidation. This is a fiendishly difficult area, and I know we are particularly grateful that they are doing a lot of the hard thinking because uh, it's quite nice to share some of that burden, but also to be challenged in terms of mm -hmm. consolidation. If, if whether that is through super funds, whether that is a kind of private sector consolidation, or whether that is a more kind of quasi-public sector consolidation, is, is an amazingly complex kind of approach. We're looking at what's happening in the master trust area, and, and that's, I mean, that's relatively straightforward when you compared to what would have to happen for there to be significant consolidation in the DB area. Um, we're looking at things like the local authority uh, experience to see whether or not there are lessons that we can learn from that consolidation. Um, uh, I don't think when the white paper comes out will we say, fabulous, we've got an answer. I think what we'll be talking about is direction of travel. One of the great advantages at the moment of, of being in government is that you can't legislate. Uh, in some areas, that causes great problems. In other areas, that's a really good advantage. Uh, so I actually think that, that we have time to really think through the different consolidation models and really think through the, the pros and cons of different ways of consolidation and, and getting people to understand what it would actually require in order to start down that route and indeed whether or not it is the right route to, for us to go down. Uh, other areas in the white paper, uh, uh, Leslie mentioned the discussion around uh, the regulator's powers. Uh, I, I, I mean, there is a manifesto commitment on uh, broadening and widening the regulator's powers, so I would expect there to be changes in there. I think we would both agree that it's probably not the area that people focus on around you know, the point of uh, corporate transactions, which is, is perhaps the area where, where re the regulator probably needs more powers. But one of the things that the regulator has been doing is testing those powers, because you know, if we're going to give them broader powers, then we need to know that these are the things that, that, that will make the difference. We're, we're not in, in the, I hope we're not in the game of just trying to give people more powers in, in the hope that they may need them more, uh, rather than actually making sure that these are the things that will be most effective in, in supporting Leslie in, uh, in her incredibly difficult job. Um, in terms of the, the, I won't talk about governance because um, that's the other area of, of the, the white paper because I know Chris is going to cover uh, some areas around governance changes. But just to give you an idea about timings, uh, people always ask about timing, so I thought I'll, I, I'll get in my answer first. My definition of winter is ends, <laughs> ends at the end of February. There are several members of my team in the audience, so they may want to go back to their desks and start writing. Um, <laughs> um, but I, you know, I'm hopeful that we will be able to get the white paper out uh, by the end of February. 2018. <laughs> 2018. <laughs> um, that said, as I say, you know, in terms of legislation, the chances, I think, of a pensions bill before 2020 look very slim to me. Uh, but, uh, so we do have some time, so the white paper will not meet, immediately lead to legislation, but more in terms of another stage of how do we develop this and how do we ensure that we 
we do make the right changes now. One of the things that I do kind of impress both on myself and, and on my team is, I think this is probably our last chance to make changes to the, to the DB sector. Uh, you, you, we, when was, I can't remember the last time we did a white paper on defined benefits. I would guess it was probably more than 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years from now, uh, any white paper on defined benefits is going to be quite a different beast. So taking the time and really thinking through the issues, and thinking through the issues, not just what are the things we're facing now, but what do we believe this sector will look like in 10 years' time and beyond, and what are the things that we can do to secure members' benefits and ensure the sector is stable and sustainable uh, uh, going forward, I think is where our focus is. Charlotte, thank you very much. Um, and Chris will now have to say a few words and then, um, Thank you. There's quite a few questions that have been coming through on the app <coughs> while um, people have been speaking. So um, we'll start a discussion after <coughs> Chris has spoken around some of the key themes <coughs> arising from that. <coughs> and hopefully there'll still be some time for, for Q&A as well. But um, Chris. So, so Charlotte has to be very careful about what she says about the white paper. I guess the next five minutes is my chance to um, give some of my thoughts and, and influence some of the thinking. Um, there's a saying which is, is, don't wait for a crisis to make a plan, and I think that's quite apt here. Um, I completely agree. There's been talk recently about a crisis in DB. I don't think there's a crisis in DB. I think there's an enormous challenge. Um, benefits have been promised, and we need to do absolutely everything we can to, to make those happen. Um, I think really pleased that the regulators um, got a real sense of continuous improvement about it recently. I think that really comes out in the TPR future piece. And, and that, that's a bit of a theme um, for me, something I think about a lot. And what I'm going to do for the next five minutes was actually pick up three points around the governance theme um, where I think uh, there should be some focus in, in the near future and where focus uh, hopefully leads to improvement in expected outcomes. Um, so the, just in summary, to start, the, the three points I'm going to talk about are, first of all, the need for some form of sharing. Um, or consolidation of some form. I think we need a plan. Secondly, around um, insurance market capacity and whether actually are we being realistic about how many schemes are going to be able to remove liabilities from the balance sheet. I think as an industry we need to understand that a bit better. And thirdly, uh, the important question of getting the right mixture of skills onto to trustee boards. And again, I think there needs to be a bit more active consideration of that. So if I take those in turn, firstly starting with the, the need for sharing, highly complex areas we've already talked about. I think if, if I just simplify it down into one sentence for me, it's that in a world of limited resource, I really fear that we're spreading ourselves way too thin. And, and absolutely, there are enormous challenges um, and barriers. There's also vested interests at play. Um, so just following logically from that fear that we're spreading resource thin, I think the answer has to be some form of, of sharing. Um, I think clearly we need to think it through carefully. There's a lot of complexity. At the same time, I think there's things that can be done that are, that are actually things that can probably be done relatively simply and, and quickly. So it's kind of getting the balance. Um, so I don't think a revolution, a, a sort of Big Bang style consolidation is likely, but more of a, an evolution over time. And so hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to see that in the white paper. Um, I'm hoping that there's going to be a drive towards a plan of some form and, and a plan that we can measure against so that, you know, if we've got 6,000 schemes today, then where do we want to be in a certain amount of time? Enormous amount of views on, on how we might head in that direction. I think I'm going to pick out one thing, which is the chair's statement, which, which clearly seems to be getting some... Um, traction and a, a growing sense of consensus. This is something I think could probably be done fairly easily. Clearly it's happening in DC and seems to be having a posit positive effect there. So, you know, there's an example of something that could be done, I think, in the short term um, that could actually really um, encourage trustee boards to actively think about their governance and to state transparently what they're going to do to make positive improvements as time goes on. Uh, also a real uh, believer in, in, in the importance of resource within governance. So for me, governance is, is 
in large part the, the people that are in the structure. Um, so, and Leslie touched on this briefly in her comments. Um, there was a paper recently with PLSA that I was involved in. And for me, I think there, there should be a regulatory shift towards inputs rather than outputs. Um, I think we're now seeing that with TPR focusing on uh, professional trustees, which is great in my view. I think it'd be great to see that go further to the whole trustee board and then beyond in a world where there was consolidation and there was executive functions that were supporting many trustee boards then beyond into those functions. So the second point I raised around the insurance market. So if you speak to anyone who looks after a pension plan with varying degrees of confidence, they'll often tell you the year or the window of years when they're going to be ready to insure their benefits. And yet we've got, um, I think, a run rate at the moment of around 10 billion a year in the UK that's being insured. I think there's some capacity for that to grow, but, but not hugely, maybe to 20, maybe at a push a bit higher. Yet we've got over 2 trillion of liabilities on that basis. So something's got to give. And I guess the point I'm making here is, in terms of a governance question, it potentially really reframes that governance question. So if actually a lot of these schemes are going to be on the balance sheet for a lot longer, or possibly forever, then it reframes that governance question and, and obviously puts more uh, focus on making sure that we have the right governance structures in place. The final point um, was around the makeup of the board. So we've already acknowledged we have a, a DB sector that's predominantly in runoff now. Um, to a large extent, it becomes about just really running these schemes as well as possible. And so getting the right mix of skills on the, on the board is hugely important. And for me, I think this has to be much more like, say, the board of a large PLC who might look at the skills that are there, the skills they feel they need, and then seek to, to fill the gaps, basically. So for me, I think a lot more uh, encouragement or, or, and requirement for trusty chairs to focus on that area. And also, indeed, probably for sponsors, I think, to be supportive of that action. Um, so those, those were the three points, the, the sharing, the insurance market capacity, and the mix of skills on the board. Chris, thank you very much. Um, the, quite a few questions have come through. I really sort of uh, distill them into three themes. Um, trustee governance and um, some of the initiatives that are being taken... Um, consolidation and various challenges around that. And the third area of questions were more specifically around the DB task force. Uh, this session isn't really designed to, to, to tackle that. We will be picking up some of the key themes from the task force report around the consolidation discussion that we're just about to have. But I'm sure if, if people want to talk about the task force report to, afterwards, um, we, we can arrange that. But I, I want to focus this session around the, the, the other areas. Um, Leslie, in, in relation to um, you know, the, the trustees' approach, and, and also picking up a question, the trustees' approach is very much more um, moving towards uh, directive, you know, a, approach, um, comply rather than comply or explain. Um, how do you see that manifesting in terms of actions? And picking up a question from, from the audience, um, how does that relate to your assessment of trustee competence or incompetence? And have you ever removed trustees on grounds of competence or otherwise? Uh, I believe we have in a couple of, uh, of cases, but of course the crossover between, as it were, incompetence and criminal behaviour at times can be fairly blurry. So, But uh, what I, I'd just like to challenge you on the comply or comply or explain thing, actually. We are, yes, talking about how we as the regulator are going to be out there more monitoring compliance, uh, that type of thing. But what we're trying to do is give tools to trustees... For example, the, 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 can we give more clarity on funding parameters, for example, is, is an example... What does normal look like? What, you know, won't excite us as a regulator? Versus what falls outside the parameters of what is normal for your size and type of scheme? And this can apply funny, you can find a number of other areas as well. To try and help trustees um, deal with this challenge, because smaller schemes tell us we just want to be told what to do. Larger schemes say we know what we're doing, we're well advised, uh, all the rest of it, we've got good skills on the board. We know where we want to get to, and how we get there is really a matter for us. So what we want to try and do is give examples of good and pauper behaviour, give examples of the parameters of what is normal, and then encourage people to either stay within those or to be able to explain why they can't. 
Uh, going outside those parameters does not necessarily mean that we will take an inf enforcement action. Right. But where we see really poor behaviour, persistent poor behaviour, an inability to explain why that is the right approach, that's when our interest as a regulator gets triggered. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think picking up on some of the consolidation questions mm. that have come through, which really play to, I think, Charlotte's comments about the, the white paper and also Chris's comments, um, there's a few things that I just welcome panel views on. Um, can DB consolidation be effective without the ability to harmonise benefits, was one comment. Um, and, and consolidation could incur great cost. Um, how many parties need to get involved with that? What's the likelihood of, of the net benefit sort of exceeding the cost? Um, and linked to that, um, how can we ensure better value for money for smaller schemes? Is consolidation the only way? How feasible is consolidation? So I'm interested to just expand a bit on consolidation. Clearly it's going to feature, I mean, it already has featured quite a lot um, early this year, but um, so... Do we start? Uh, I, th I think the, uh, whoever made the point about um, uh, the benefits of consolidation uh, without harmonisation of benefits, uh, it, you know, it's a very good point. But you can go so far with regards to consolidation uh, and get, get a certain amount of benefits, and there's, there's very, there are some barriers to, to that happening now, but, but realistically there aren't that many barriers to that happening in the DB world at the moment, uh, but, but in order to really make that big jump forward, then you would have, re you do, we would have to consider whether or not harmonisation of benefits was the right way forward. I mean, that's always really difficult, because harmonisation of benefits on an actuarial basis generally means that somebody will lose. You know, you're, you're trying to do it on a, on, a, on a scheme basis or bringing people into schemes. That's, there's a certain rough justice that happens when that, uh, when that occurs. Uh, and if that is the approach that we end up taking, it's, we have to face up to that, that that's, that that's one of the, the big questions is, you know, for the kind of greater good and the greater security, some people may end up losing some of the aspects of benefits that they have acquired. That, and that's difficult. It's difficult legally as well. Um, but I think it is the sort of question that we need to kind of look at if we are going to, you know, as we move into this runoff period, uh, you know, 6,000 schemes, I think, you know, we all think that 6,000 is a lot. Um, but it becomes, you know, it, it's, ev it's even more of an issue as schemes become smaller uh, and, and, and have less... Um, uh, less members. Uh, so um, I've forgotten what the second point was around. Um, whether small schemes, whether consolidation is the only route for small schemes. Uh. I mean, I, 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 it seems to me unlikely that we're going to force consolidation. I think it will be about incentivising consolidation um, and setting up the, the, the structures that allow it to happen in an easier way. And, and in a... a Last week, when nudge um, resulted in sort of Nobel prizes, I, I guess if, if there is a chair statement and, and chairs are commenting on um, why they've or they might have looked at it but discounted it, or they are continuing to look at it, that nudge will have an impact across the whole industry yeah. views. So, I would sort of um, link it. I think one of Charlotte's comments about if you came in ten years and tried to make big changes, it's perhaps too late, and. So for me, I think we need to be careful not to be put off doing anything just because the whole thing's so complex. I actually think there can be a huge difference just, for instance, from, say, admin consolidation. And by admin, I'm talking about, you know, the, the advisory piece and, um, say, some of the internal resource. So, you know, there's some things that can be done before you get to the benefit harmonisation challenge that are actually potentially quite helpful. I also think some of the benefits of those are probably bigger than we're able to actually prove. And what I mean by that is if you look at some of the studies by, say, Ambik Shear, Clark and Irwin, and some of the, the um, evidence they've come up with for the, the improved performance that you can get from great governance, then, but, but the problem with, with when you're putting out a study and trying to objectively justify something, then it's very difficult to say, you know, it's going to be this many basis points. So I think there's some gains out there that are actually not, that are very difficult to write down. I think, think your point's a very good one. One of the issues, I think, in the consolidation <laughs> discussion is the benefits of consolidation are very difficult to articulate and enumerate. Mm. You know, good governance, maybe better investment, you know, uh, 
the, they're very, very difficult to put a number on. The costs and the risks of doing this are very, very ap apparent. Mm. Uh, and there's always a cost in terms of just actually taking the step for something which is risky and different. Um, uh, and you know, taking the time to really think through that debate mm -hmm. you know, is, is where we currently are. And I would encourage people to get involved in it because we do have an opportunity to really think about, is this where we want this industry to go and where we want this sector to go? Um, which you know, now is the time for us to, to really do that thinking. Um, but to take one final thing, which is changing the lens from scheme to the individual. I, I need to apologise in advance. Um, having done a number of these sessions over the years, sometimes we've been struggling for questions. Um, today we're going to struggle because there's no chance I can get through the probably 20 or 25 questions that have come through. So I really do appreciate it. I've tried to pick up the, the sort of key points. But so changing the lens to, to one at the individual level, um, what are the panel's views on the increase in pace of transfers out of DV schemes um, and does that cause concerns and um, should it be allowed to continue um, in, in its current form? Um, maybe Leslie can say that and then we will have just a couple of minutes for questions from the floor as well. Sure. So obviously, I mean, we have, uh, everybody will be aware, seen an increased level of transfers, the rates are very attractive and so on at the moment. As a regulator, I have two concerns here. Firstly, are the people who are deciding to make that transfer making, uh, doing so on a fully informed basis? Do they really understand what they are giving up? What can we do to help trustees support them, give them the necessary information? There are um, you know, uh, protections in there in terms of having to seek uh, advice if it's over £30,000, that, that type of thing. Hugely, hugely important. People have said, shouldn't you take, you know, do you need to look at whether it's right to say that very often people will not be doing the right thing if they transfer out but our focus is on are they getting all the information they need do they know for example about spouses independence provision that they might be giving up that type of thing so i think are people in a position to make a fully informed decision and in getting the right information point one point two is the level of transfers out going to pose a problem for uh, the funding of db schemes uh, in our view, not at the moment, but we are monitoring it closely. There is, of course, if it continues at a high level, a, a liquidity challenge potentially for some uh, schemes. I think uh, many are well aware of that from talking to trustees who are facing this. Um, but again, we, we, uh, we monitor closely um, and it isn't a problem as yet. Um, one thing I've learned even in just two and a half years in this job is that the situation can change very quickly and we'll probably be having an entirely different conversation in six months' time. Thank you, Leslie. Um, time probably for a couple of questions. If, if we can, um, we'll just take the questions um, in a block, um, then see if we can deal with those in an in a efficient manner. There's one. So we have one on microphone four. Any other questions? And one on microphone one. So if we can take both of those questions, please. Um, the, right. we're back the room subject, uh, Michael Branwell, Equity. On the subject of consolidation, you mentioned that you did not want to force people, um, and yet there was still a theory there that it would be necessary to take small schemes, which, with thanks to Ms. Titcom, we have learnt a lot. We are a very small scheme, 96% funded, rock solid, um, um, rock solid consolidation with our employer. And it's working, and it's working for a very small number of people. Is there any chance of an explanation why you should take a small scheme, which has been through the mangle once with TPR, but has come out the other side stronger and better? Why would you take such a scheme and wish to consolidate it with somebody else? Right, thank you very much. We'll just pause that for a second, and we'll take this question down at the front of the room as well, please. Um, Amisa from Coney Castle, DB Scheme. We've been talking about this scheme that you want to be affordable or within 10 years. But you've got a strategy program whereby everything has been working smoothly. And we look, if you look at our figures, we see most of the scheme will be funded within 10 years. What are the scale for? If down on figure down in the board, you see that everything is working on program as, pro, as programmed. Mm -hmm. And there's no fear for people not being paid and to be funded within 10 years. 
I mean, I think in some ways both your points are, Thank you. are, are, are similar. You know, I, I don't think I have any interest. I don't think any minister has interest. I don't think Leslie has any interest in, in focusing our energy on schemes which are going to be okay. Um, what we are talking about are whether or not we need to make changes uh, to support schemes and to support the sector where we think that there are issues. Uh, or to, to provide some sort of kind of release where, where there are you know, issues with the employer and the, and, and the scheme. Uh, our focus is not at all, I think, on schemes where you know, I, in 10 years they will be fully funded or you know, small schemes that are well run and in a good position. I mean, that, Absolutely. I mean, I'm quite clear. The best support for a DB scheme is a profitable employer that continues to make contributions into the scheme in accordance with the agreed schedule or recovery plan, absolutely. Uh, and at, as the regulator, what we look at is the risks of that not continuing to be the case. Does that necessarily drive that sort of theme, a scheme immediately into consolidation? Absolutely not. Like you, we're interested in exploring the stressed schemes and the schemes with stressed employers uh, and thinking about them primarily, which is what we hope the white paper will focus on in this regard. I think if we put that in the context of a chair's statement, that's an example of a scheme that would be able to write a very strong statement. Yeah. yeah thank you very much. Um, I now need to bring this to a session, not least because lunch um, beckons. Um, it's in the exhibition hall until 2.15. Um, so there's somebody waving at you. Oh, right. sorry. I can't. Number three. Number three. Right. Yeah. Hello. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure I should give my name now, but uh, uh, Abhishek Shiraz of Columbia Threadneedle Investments. On the topic of security of schemes enter runoff and running them well, to, to Chris's point on the makeup of the board and the, uh, and the latest DB annual funding statement where we talk about uh, quote unquote schemes should have an appropriate cash flow management policy, I think it's quite useful to get any additional color on what that definition means or how to determine that to be the case, perhaps something similar to the lines of uh, determining poor behavior or standards of behavior, yeah. that approach could be quite helpful. Okay. So probably best if I say that that is a good example of an area where we would uh, look to see if we can help trustees who want help to understand what that would look like. It's a good example of an additional tool or guidance that we could give people. But all the time there's a balance to be struck between bombarding people with a volume of stuff and actually giving them stuff that's really, really useful. So we're trying to strike that. But uh, it's a good example uh, of where we might try and indicate what good looks like. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I think best practice will just start to emerge in, in practice. And, and um, advisors, of course, will start to familiarise themselves with what good practice looks like as well. So lunch in the, in the hall. Um, can you please... Um, rate the session on the app and provide any tweets or any other comments. Um, but finally, would you please join me in thanking all of our speakers? Thank you.